Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, I'd like to start by acknowledging our executive dean, Professor Zetun Kosi, other representatives from college management. Here I see Professor Aswehangwi Simabandu Muzusi, our head of research and graduate studies in the college. Professor Michelle Fine, our guest for the week, and I would also like to acknowledge our respondents. I will see Professor Nokutula Savangani and Professor Hugo Kenham. And all of you, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. What an honor to be together with you this afternoon. What an honor to have spent the week with Professor Michelle Fine. We had been looking forward to having you with us at UNISA Prof, and we are truly honored that you could be with us this afternoon. I know that our students, mostly our master and doctoral students who've spent hours and hours with you this week have been sending notes of appreciation, uh, beautiful, amazing, wonderful, uh, feedback that we've been receiving, and I think uh, on behalf of the college, um, we're truly honored, and we appreciate the gifts that you've brought us. We appreciate the gifts that you continue giving us, um, and we are looking forward to more of those gifts this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to now invite Professor Zetun Gosi, our Executive Dean, to come and offer opening remarks and to also welcome us officially. Let's give her a round of applause. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We are in August. Is the month of Imbogodo. Let us just ululate for our Imbogodo. <laughs> Yes, uh, Prof. Michelle, fine. This is just to say welcome to our church. We appreciate you. And Saubo Baba, it means hello, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so colleagues, as a College of Human Sciences, we appreciate your presence. And we are looking forward to the public lecture as delivered by our Honorable guests, we are very proud of Prof. Michelle, our A-rated scholar. And um, your time, it's valuable. To the CHS community, to Chief Albert Lutuli staff, to our students, postdoc, to colleagues here at UNISA and our stakeholders, you are welcomed to this uh, event. As part of the 150 year celebration, this is one of the activities that Chief Albert Lutuli is hosting in partnership with the College of Human Sciences and the project Inside Outside. We are really saying we have reached this stage with you supporting us all the way. 
When I looked into the title that Prof. Michelle will deliver, I said, Epistemic Justice in the Belly of the Carceral States, Joys, Heartbeats, and Radical Rapture. I wanted to unpack so that I understand it for myself. Then I went to check what is epistemic justice. It's about treating everyone's worth as bearing the same weight when providing knowledge. It's allowing people to have their voices. It's exploring ways of fair use of knowledge. It's a radical a rapture. You know, when you think of a rapture, you think of something that, I'm sure you've got that. Mm, radical change. You know, when you want to understand the meaning of rapture, it drives you again to radical change, you know, which means radical rapture again. The change, we are looking into how can we be brutally honest in the way we engage with one another. It's one someone who will change things. It's transformation. As the College of Human Sciences is always talking about decoloniality and transformation in how we do things in the college. And also we're looking at this active agent in interpretation of the knowledge that we deliver. Prof. Michelle Fine, when I was reading, I checked now and I was looking at the two continents, you know. We are here in the African continent, you are in the America, but when you talk about challenges that are faced by vulnerable communities, you find that there are similarities, which means today we are going to, we are going to unpack and then we are going to engage and learn more. I'm not sure whether colleagues will remember Prof. Mungwini who delivered his inaugural address on the 24th of August, 2017. His title was The Question of Epistemic Justice, Polemics, Contestations, and Dialogue. His lecture reflected in the unfinished humanistic project of decolonialization in Africa. So when I checked his topic, and then today's topic, I realized that uh, Prof. Michelle, you are going to assist us in our journey to decolonize our curriculum, to decolonize our thinking, because this is where the college wants to move and make sure that our curriculum is relevant and then it responds to the needs of our communities. So, ladies and gentlemen, I would love to thank Prof. Sekhalo and her team the Inside Outside Project team, and everybody who's here, specifically the partnership you are having with Prof. Michelle Fine, because you brought her here so that we grow in our understanding on decoloniality. We're looking forward to the lecture and further engagements. I'm looking forward to the two respondents, the way they are going to respond because they are coming from different angles. Prof. Hugo and Prof. Shabangan. Ladies and gentlemen, may we give them a round of applause as in, thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to introduce Professor Michelle Fine. And I have, I have your bio here. Um, but I'm, I'm also thinking about the journey uh, that, that we've had. Uh, it's a rare opportunity that one gets to be in a position to, to, to introduce in the way that I have to introduce you today, someone that I consider as a sister, someone that I consider as transnational solidarity, collective, someone that we carry uh, each other in, in the works and the struggles uh, and the justice work that we do. Um, my intellectual mother. <laughs> um, I don't know if you'll remember, you gave me this many years ago. Um, this was 
uh, just after I, was, I completed my PhD. Dear Buleng, thank you for teaching me so much and for allowing us to build a life together with pride, joy, and anticipation for what our future holds. Uh, this is hanging in my office. It's been over a decade. Um, and never had I thought that today you'll be here at UNISA with us this afternoon. And for that, I'm very grateful to Professor Ngozi, Professor Azwi, to the college management for their support and their belief in this project of social justice, this project of decolonization, this project of transnational solidarities, and what we can learn from each other. So this afternoon, we really look forward to continue learning from each other. Ladies and gentlemen, Michelle Fine is a distinguished professor of critical psychology, women's studies, social welfare, American studies, and urban education. This morning, uh, she addressed our unrated emerging scholars who are hoping to apply for NRF in the future. And she was talking about the importance of finding that core in the work that you're doing, that she's in critical psychology, women's studies, social welfare, American studies, all of these together. Those who know about the NRF, they'll say, what is, what is your field? What is your focus? What is your work? It, she does all of these, but at the core of it, it's about justice. It's about ensuring that people have got a voice. It's about ensuring that we create spaces in the world that allows for those that are deemed to be less than those are in, that are in the margin to make sure that they come to the center. And this is her life project through all of these different disciplines. So she's very much disciplined, uh, disobedient in that way, that she, she, she bumps and jumps between all these different disciplines. I'm sorry, I, I digress. I can't help myself. Uh, Michelle has been recognized and appointed here at UNISA as a professor extraordinaire in the Department of Psychology uh, since 2021. As a scholar, an expert witness in litigation, uh, a teacher and an educational activist, her work centers theoretically and epistemically on questions of justice, dignity, privilege, and oppression, and how solidarities emerge. She has taught at a number of places. She's taught at the University of Pennsylvania between 1981 and 1991. And then she came to the Graduate Center, City University of New York, where she has served, and, and then she has served uh, over and above being a teacher and a scholar as an expert witness where she puts into practice the work that she does theoretically also uh, and in the work, uh, in the communities that she works with. As an expert witness, she's done a range of work of educational, racial, and gender justice, class action lawsuits, including girls suing for access to Central High School in Philadelphia and the Citadel in South California. Students of color suing for racial equity in Widowie, Alabama. Youth fighting for equitable financing and facilities in Williams versus State of California. And most recently, a finance inequity lawsuit for the children of Baltimore. So when we talk about engaged scholarship, how is our theory also speaking to praxis? How are we using our work for justice in practical terms? And I think through this work, uh, Prof. Michelle Fine succeeds in doing that. With a rich international network of collaborations and activist scholar colleagues, she spent time teaching and researching at the Institute for Maori Studies in Auckland, New Zealand, the Center for Narrative Research at the University of East London, uh, in the UK, University of Witwatersrand, because we also have East London in South Africa, University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, Universidad Federal de Pernambuco, Brazil, and at the Euroclio Institute in Nicosia, Cyprus. She has accompanied a range of education movements with do documentation and empirical evidence, including the small schools movement, detracking performance-based assessments, restorative justice, college in prison, and youth participatory action research. And in 2020, with Karina 
Periomka, and in collaboration with Dr. Linda Darling Hammond, she published Assessing College Readiness Through Authentic Student Work. Okay. In 2022-2023, Professor Fine has been the primary evaluator for the New York Performance Learning and Assessment Pilot Plan Pilot for New York State and the New York State My Brother's Keeper Initiative. Across 30 years, key publications of Prof. Michelle include many classics, books and articles on high school push-out, adolescent sexuality, called The Missing Discourse of Desire, the National Evaluation of the Impact of College in Prison, the struggles and strength of the children of incarcerated adults, the wisdom of Muslim American youth, as well as chapters and books on epistemic justice and critical participatory research. She is the author and co-author and editor and co-editor of more than 20 books and policy briefs, and her recent publications can be found online. Just Google her, she's very present online. With this, ladies and gentlemen, it is my absolute honor to invite my friend, sister, colleague, Professor Michelle Fine. Thank you. I think it fell asleep. He will assist you. Oh, thank you, sir. I need you always in yeah. my life. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for letting that with you. Thank you, Dean Kosef, for that beautiful introduction. Um, I have spent an incredible week here with students, with faculty, with administrators, with amazing people who make me look like I know what I'm doing. Um, I really want to thank Pulang Sahalo. I want to thank Ed Foray. I want to thank Jill Bradbury and my other South African family at WITS, but I really want to thank you for welcoming me into the UNISA family. Um, it is an honor, it is humbling, um, and it's been a joy. Somebody said, I think Hugo said, if you worked hard. I, 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 we did a lot of meetings. Some of you I've seen a lot this week, but it's just been joyous and beautiful. So I am going to speak about epistemic justice in the belly of the carceral state. By the carceral state, I'm referring to my country that is going through trauma, hatred, violence, white supremacy, over-incarceration, anti-black violence, and incredible resistance. All that's happening at once. That is not a foreign story to you all. So my talk weaves in conversation with the writings of two distinguished colleagues, Professor Hugo Canham and Professor, bear with me, Nukufula Labangani, close in the name. Take her word for it, not mine. Thank you. I almost never speak alone about the projects I'm going to present to you. I usually present with formerly incarcerated women for whom this is as much their work as mine. These are projects born in research collectives, but today I'm compelled to share the long sadistic history of racialized incarceration in the United States, and even more so to excavate the rich unknown evidence of collective resistance, knowledge production, and radical critical reimaginings conjured by women, largely women of color, who are doing time. I'm going to be drawing on 30 years of critical participatory action research projects with people in prison, and I want to probe epistemic questions, questions about whose knowledge counts. What do we in the academy learn about people in prison? What do we learn from people in prison? What gets reported in the media about who is criminalized? 
And I want to raise, you, you were very kind to say that I will help you decolonize everything I know about decolonizing. I have learned from many of the people in this room. But really, the impossibility of decolonizing knowledges in the global north and yet a goal worth pursuing. Our projects are rooted in an ethic of no research on us without us, which has a long history in Maori, New Zealand, a long history in the HIV AIDS movement in the US and here, a long history in the disability justice movement. People saying enough of your external research on us, pathologizing us, turning us into objects. We will do research on ourselves, maybe if you're lucky with academics. You will hear about a range of participatory projects um, perched at the nexus of, we, of what we call decarceration, getting people out of prison, and abolition. There's a big movement in the United States to just close down prisons and reimagine what do we do with the pain and the struggles of people who end up inside. We will, I will try to catalog the joys, the struggles, the ruptures, and also the heartbreaks of doing community-based research. Many of those lawsuits that you talked about, I wish I could tell you we won, some we won, but the morning after doesn't quite look like the struggle that preceded, and I know that's a story that's familiar here too. So I want us to honor the heartbreaks and to tell our students about the heartbreaks so they don't think they did something wrong when they do research for social justice. You will learn about our work at the Public Science Project, a research collective at my other home, the CUNY Graduate Center, where activists and everyday people gather with traditionally educated researchers like myself to initiate collaborative public social science for the collective good in New York, nationally, and in transnational co coalitions. We had a beautiful gathering on Zoom between a collective of formerly incarcerated women in New York and a, a group of incarcerated and formerly incarcerated women here in um, Pretoria or Johannesburg. And it was just a magical gathering of pain and possibility across oceans and national borders. As encouraged by Professor Kanam in our projects, we too, Hugo, try to draw on orality, folklore. If you don't know his new book, leave now and go get it. It's incredible. <laughs> Music, dissected official archives, poetry and stories of survivance in hell. Survivance is a, an indigenous word in the States developed by Gerald Visenor. It's a combination of survival and resistance. And as Professor, you speak. Zakatule. Nokotula, that part I got. I got it last night and I memorized it. Implores we must design public science with and not on people. Seeking to pierce what Charles Mills calls epistemologies of ignorance, the kind of privilege, whiteness, wealth, distance that comes from the global north, but often from academics all over the world, representing communities as we see them, rather than as they would be narrated in their own community. I'm gonna skip the rest of this because I've got a PowerPoint, but let me just say, I hope you will hear how in participatory projects, we can nourish critical wisdoms already marinating in the margins, in the townships, in the prisons, in the schools, in the communities, in the social movements, and engage critical participatory research to shift personal problems to public and political issues, as happened so often in the sessions we had with students here, where students were kind of timid about studying what feels like a personal issue, but is in fact a global struggle 
whether it's about colorism or poverty or state violence or intimate violence or absent mothers or there were a whole range of topics that the students of UNISA are investigating that are brilliant and somehow represented as small, but they're powerful. They're multi-scalar. And then I, as I told them, I worry that when they do a literature review and draw from Global North literature, it kind of flattens the vibrancy and wisdom of how these issues take root locally. So that's a, that's a struggle we need to think about because to take a big, bold question and then squeeze it into a flattened Global North colonial literature, um, we need to rethink that. Anyway, and how do we shed light on those who dwell within and bear witness to structural and historic dynamics that contain punish, isolate, deprive, and blame communities. As a provisional place to begin together today, I want to argue for the reparative debt of higher education to communities and movements in struggle, to produce scholarship, as Professor Sakalo has, that provokes aesthetic awakenings and not anesthetic numbing. And so I will begin with great anticipation and humility, um, and we'll see where we go. Okay. Uh, I could use a friend. Can you just make a slideshow? Okay. Thank you so much. Good. So then do I just hit that when I want yeah, to move ahead? So we are going to hear from our distinguished collaborators in a bit, but I just want to say to both of you, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for flying, for driving, for being with, for sharing dinner. Um, if you don't know their work, this is a snippet of both of their writings. Um, we hear we hear a contestation of Euro-Western knowledge from a beautiful piece of yours that draws from Audre Lorde and your own um, extensions of that, challenging whether or not we can learn by using the master's tools. And will the master's tools dismantle the master's house? You say you are suspect of knowledge systems that are essentially inward looking to the exclusion of others. A will to ignorance that forecloses any possibility of mutual recognition and acknowledgement. You want us to theorize the border spaces as a place of disjuncture between stories learned on the laps of four mothers and in the drumming of forefathers in communities of origin with where Eurocentric knowledge systems are exposed, espoused, and taught in the university, and you ask us so eloquently to problematize what universities are doing and whether we are reproducing their knowledge systems. <coughs> and Professor Canham writes in his newest book, right, it's Deathscapes, he offers a theory method of being, Mapunodo theory, both, both predates historical incursions and responses to the unhumaning of capitalism and anti-blackness while emanating a poetics of relation. Both of your works very much sat in my heart as I was trying to craft a talk that would speak between us and to to you, so I thank you for your work. So as I said earlier, the Public Science Project is a 25-year research institute at CUNY where we bring together stakeholders, youth, educators, activists, policymakers, to collaborate, to generate questions worth asking. We create what my colleague Maria Torre would call a contact zone 
of, uh, as a research collective, we bring very different knowledges to be in conversation with each other. We seek to create knowledge from the wisdom of those most impacted by social injustice, to create anti-racist and evidence-based public science. We think hard about to whom are we accountable, and we think hard about our multiple audiences. In fact, in the student sessions, we had students writing letters. To whom is your research accountable? Who lives in your heart that you want to know about the work that you're doing? And it could be a younger self, or an older self, or a child long gone, or a grandmother far away, no longer with us. It could be an ancestor, it could be a river that's been polluted when we do this work with women in prison. They always write to children who passed while they were incarcerated, or to women still inside. It's really important for us as researchers to have a sense of deep accountability. We can no longer treat data like low-hanging fruit or questions as a privilege for us to just ask whatever's interesting. The world is too fraught. I would say we all, very differently privileged, but as academics privileged, have an obligation to contribute to either challenging dominant lies or honoring local knowledges or accompanying movements for justice. Critical participatory action research is not a methodology. It's not cameras, it's not narratives, it's not children interviewing elders, it's all of that. But most importantly, it's an epistemology. It's a way, it's a way of honoring and challenging whose knowledge matters. And probably the most offensive part of critical par is that it challenges that the academy has a monopoly on expertise. You all have a grandmother or somebody who you know knows much more than many of us in this room whose knowledge has not been appreciated. So critical par projects, quantitative, qualitative, archival, artistic, they create, we create research collectives with those most impacted, generating questions that we can ask together and then deciding um, with a depth of commitment who deserves the findings of our public scholarship. Our first product, to use a funny word, is always back to the community is always something to be of use to the community. So we did a project in Harlem about aggressive police brutality. People in the community gathered surveys from over a thousand people in the community. They analyzed New York Police Department data to check whether or not the official records were really official. They found that 60% of elderly folks were told to keep moving when they were just drinking coffee in their front courtyard, that 70% of the young people were called the N-word, that um, something like 80% of the young people had been stopped by the police and over 90% of those stops were innocent. That is, no arrest, no conviction, but it wears on the body. It weathers the soul, it diminishes trust, it separates communities. So we do work, and then we presented that data, the community did, presented the data. One evening, there were drummers, and as the sun set, on the, right near Yankee Stadium in the Bronx, on the side of a public housing building, they presented the data as a letter from the community to the NYPD. You can go online and look at the Mars Justice Project. And it was just a simple PowerPoint that said, Dear New York Police Department, we're the Mars Justice Project, a participatory research project of residents in this community. We learned that most of our 
people have been stopped by you. We learned that many of our people, and they would give the statistic, have been physically hurt by you. We learned that 90% of the stops are innocent. Please don't do this. This is our home. We pray here. We send our children to school here and then out the windows because nobody knew this was coming because if we told anybody, the police would have shut it down. So people started putting signs out their windows. This is our home. And then within seven minutes, as was predicted, the police came because it's, it's not illegal to shine something, but it is to say something. But the work was done. And so the first product is always back to the community to educate people that your experience is not yours alone. And then to connect them with young people in Brooklyn and young people hopefully in Pretoria and in London so that we're beginning to understand our shared struggles and our shared laughter and beauty and resistance. All right, so that's Public Science Project. I'm, of course, going to run out of time, so I want to get to some of the... So 100 years ago, in a prison cell in Italy, the political theorist Antonio Gramsci wrote, and this will sound like it was written today by you, by me, the crisis consists precisely in the fact that the old is dying and the new cannot yet be born. In this interregnum, a great variety of morbid symptoms appear. Unfortunately, in psychology, I feel like we, we fetishize the morbid symptoms without looking at the historic roots, the structures, and the ways in which communities make sense of, resist, support each other. Progressives do it and conservatives do it. Um, but by fetishizing what I would call a downstream analysis, what's wrong in those communities, and a lot of our funding comes from that. Right? Public health funding comes from a kind of problem-based, sometimes pathologizing, I would say it's our obligation to work with those most impacted because they know the history, the structures, the dynamics, the resistance, and the, re the reimagination already present in communities. All right, well, this is unreadable, but the big questions that we ask in critical part projects are for whom and with whom are you engaged in research? It's a serious question. Like just doing research with people who look like me in communities that don't look like mine, that is an arrogant act of epistemic violence. And then to present it as though it is true, woven through my lens, but to do work together to dare to do kind of solidarity projects, it's pretty powerful if you can build a space where the power dynamics are addressed, where the knowledge of those most impacted is central, um, and where together we can build knowledge not yet. We already talked about epistemic justice and letters of accountability. By critical bifocality, so the year I got bifocals, my friend Lois Weiss and I were writing this article, so in an act of great narcissism, we called it critical bifocality. But by that we mean when we write about people, we have to write about history and structures. And we write about history and structures, we must also center lives. And it's in that jazz where we can begin to make new knowledge. Separating lives from structures and history. So much work in the US on racial disparities in education. As though it's in the children, in the race, in the community, without understanding finance inequity. Where are the, where are the best credentialed teachers? Who has textbooks? What are we learning? Without doing that, we do a disservice, even if we're doing disparities work. Decolonizing whose evidence counts. 
I'm gonna go into some studies in a moment, but we're doing a project now with a group of um, women who experienced domestic violence and then were criminalized for their reactions to that. So in New York State, it's a very powerful law mo mobilized by a coalition of incarcerated, criminalized survivors, doubly surviving prison and domestic violence. These women fought for a law that said, if you can demonstrate you were experiencing domestic violence when you committed your crime, potentially your case can be reheard by the same judge. The judge has to say, ooh, I made a mistake. That's a big deal for judges. And, and, um, but it's a very powerful law. And we now have like 40 women who have gotten out. And they've joined our research collective, Have They Get Out. And they're doing narrative work. But the question even of whose evidence counts. So when a white 55-year-old woman says, I was being beaten when I was in my 20s, and that's why we killed that guy. It lands differently for juries and judges than when a black woman from the Bronx makes the same claim. White women are more likely to have evidence. They're more likely to call the police, actually. In our country, women of color, undocumented immigrants, women in poverty, are scared to call the police because they're scared someone will get shot. So they're less likely to have evidence from the police. So this question of who has evidence is racialized, it's classed, right? If a man, as one of the men who got out from this law, who's now part of our group, when he went to court and say, my uncle raped me, nobody said, did you enjoy it? Did you ask for it? And yet almost all the women who made similar claims are questioned about the validity of their stories and whether or not they. So this question even of evidence, when we think it's neutral-ish, it's already, already overdetermined. And so we're trying to work on that. Um, and I will say also in connection to that project, the question of what's your goal is already, already racialized in class. So now we have these 40 women, and I'm pointing to this because we all meet on Zoom. Because one woman got out after 23 years, and they sent her back to Panama. And her husband, who was a white guy living in Staten Island, who was her abuser, has the daughters, and she can't see them and she'll never see them, right? So she's free, and then my white, oh my God, she's free. That's the heartbreak that I'm talking about. That's the rupture that I'm talking about. And again, you all know better than I what constitutes freedom is a fraught question. Another woman joined us a few months ago. Um, she had just gotten out, this was during COVID, and she said, so I got out after 22 years I'm living in a homeless shelter with my daughter, who's 15 and kind of hates me. We're scared of getting COVID and we're scared of the people in the shelter. I'm living in the neighborhood where I was involved in a murder and people have a lot of stereotypes about me. If I knew this is what freedom meant, I might have decided to stay in. So even like, what's our goal? She's not sorry she's out, but it, it creates like, what's our work? How do we then fight that people have housing when they get out? People have support when they get out. People have women who have been out welcome them home, which is much of what we're working on. Can we change the law so women who were undocumented don't get deported at, at, for the price of freedom? All right, blah, blah, blah. I'm gonna go to some examples. But before I do that, let me just tell you, so you talked about radical ruptures. So here's one that happened uh, two weeks ago. So we do all this par work and we kind of love it and we're a little self-satisfied with it. And a colleague of, of Puleng's and myself 
former student of mine, Rachel Liebert, is a white Pakeha woman from New Zealand. She, Pakeha is just white European, and she and her colleague, uh, Taya Ann Carlson, got a big grant. Taya Ann Carlson is Maori, indigenous. They got a big grant. I guess England is living out its guilt on, with some of these grants. Anyway, whatever. Um, and so they got a big grant on intergenerational healing. Intergenerational healing, critical participatory action research, and settler colonialism. So they're bringing together groups of young Pakeha, white European New, Zeal New Zealanders, Maori, with elders and ancestors in focus groups. And they said to me nicely on the Zoom, Michelle, we kind of love your work, but it's a little colonial because you only have live co-researchers. And we're inviting in the ancestors to be in conversation with us, with memories, with artifacts, with tapes, with folklore, with poetry, with music. And we're trying to do that work of how did we, the Pakeha, end up here? Lots of it was missionary. How did we, the Maori, survive, and then there's a relational group where the Pakeha and the Maori are gonna to get together, and Taya Ann Carlson says, I'm actually a little worried about that group because I think my great-grandmother does not wanna be in a focus group with Captain James Cook. And it just forced, again, it, for, it took me to a new place, a place I hadn't thought of, of course. The next day, I was doing a PAR workshop on Zoom with a bunch of small farmers in Vermont and immigrant laborers, many um, immigrants from Central and South America. And I had them write letters of accountability. To whom is your work accountable? And I, I relayed this story with Rachel and I said, so you need to, you can write broadly. To whom is your work accountable? And then I usually say, does anybody want to read, as we did in the session yesterday? And the first immigrant farmer said, um, I wrote a letter of accountability to a river in my home country that's now totally polluted. And the next person wrote a letter to a mountaintop that had been uh, removed and mined. And a third person wrote to a group of cows and so this question of accountability opens up when we open up kind of the, the circles of people who we're in conversation with. All right, so now I'm gonna go quickly through so we have time for my friends and time for, time for questions. So in 1994, then President Bill Clinton, to think that we were critical of him, given what we've seen since. But then President Bill Clinton took um, Pell Grants out of prisons. And by that I mean federal funds that would pay for college had been available to men and women in prison prior to then. So there were 350 college and prison programs in the country. And when he took the money out, this was a kind of get tough on crime, take out the televisions, don't let the families visit, don't let them have any sports equipment, and take away college. When he took that out, there had been 350, and then it reduced to eight. So the lights went off in prisons all over the country. And when the college light went off, the adult basic education, the general, the more remedial level education, and despair just set into the, set into the prison. So, um, so the women decided we have to bring college back. This was a, like the safe space group like the women said, we've got to bring it back. How do we bring in college presidents? How do we bring in the deans? How do we bring in inside out and get colleges and you can't use money, can't use state money, can't use federal money. How do we resurrect it? So they had a gathering. 
of community people, of presidents, of university faculty, of clergy. I, I met the most radical clergy I've ever met in prison. Didn't quite know, but amazing nuns working out of liberation theology. And very quickly, within six months, college was resurrected. So 12 colleges each offered two faculty, and we went into the prisons. We taught courses in the prisons. We brought in famous writers and artists and thinkers, and the women would read their work and the artists and authors would read their work. There was an intellectual, ethical, loving community. And very soon thereafter, it was determined that we needed to document the impact of college and prison on the women, on the college environment, and on their children, and on their post-release outcomes. So they asked me to do it, and I said, why don't we do a participatory project? So this project, you can find it online. It's um, over 25 years old, but the report still exists because states are downloading it all the time on how do we stop people from returning to prison. And the best way to stop people from returning to prison, short of changing political economy and racial capitalism, is college. Drug treatment and college. It radically transforms outcomes. So we produced this report. You'll see all the names are a mix of CUNY and um, folks who are in prison. That's the website. So let me tell you quickly how we did it. But even before I do that, I just want you to know the United States incarceration is an industry. We currently incarcerate more people than you incarcerated during apartheid. Again, all of our numbers, your numbers are off and weird and not quite accurate, but the best data that are around, and it's very racialized and it's very classed. And so again, I'll, I'll send this to anybody who wants to know, but the US has the highest incarceration rate in the world, 629 for every 100,000. Rwanda is second. South Africa is 248. So we, are, we have three times the rate of incarceration. It's very hard to teach a class at a university, particularly a public, and not have a number of people who have had an incarcerated parent or brother or relative. Many of my students are doing inside out like work, not because they're just interested in it, but they're de I, we've had students who were formerly incarcerated and now have PhDs. But it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a racialized virus. It's an industry. It is a containment punishment strategy. And now that there is pretrial detention, if you don't have money to pay bail, we keep you in. That's how the numbers are going up. And women are the fastest growing. Um, all right. I'm going to tell you the good news, not the bad, not just the bad news. So we did this, we did this project. And the women built the college, and then we built a participatory documentation to mirror the values of the college. So it was run by the woman, women. It was participatory. The women decided how to discipline, how to create community, what the curriculum would be. I worked with the superintendent, who you might call the warden, um, and I met with her every other week just to tell her what we were doing. So when you're putting together a contact zone, a research collective, which was seven women inside and four of us outside, the women knew that we couldn't really have correction officers on that team. Those power dynamics are too fraught, certainly in our country. But we knew that the superintendent needed to be informed because prisons are sadistic institutions built on punitive logics that hurt people. Hurt people the work, who work there and hurt people who are contained there. And so I would meet with the superintendent every other week. Um, 
There was a committee of women running the college. There was a poetry group. There was a domestic violence support group. There was an HIV support group. There was a poetry support group. There were groups on the yard. There was a Michel Foucault study group on the yard and a, um, blah, 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 a Bell Hooks study group on the yard. Right? And then when somebody used a pen as a weapon, all the pens were taken away and they could only use crayons. So anyway, so we built a, res a participatory research infrastructure. The way we did that is how we do all of our projects. First, we have kind of a research camp where we all share our knowledge what we know, what we don't know, the questions we have, the wisdom we bring. We do this with school pushouts. We do it with foster youth. We do it with undocumented folks. We do it with whatever group we are accompanying. And then from that group of 15 who took that course, they each generated their own question under the kind of mother question, what's the impact of college on women in prison? So they generated their own questions. They each interviewed five people. So by the end of the course, we had 75 interviews. They, of course, couldn't have a tape recorder because everything is considered contraband and tape recorder, so they had to. But then they brought those 75 narratives into our research collective. And then we said, well, who wants to join a research team? We don't know how long they're going to let us stay. Um, but we're going to try to document the impact. And seven of the 15 women agreed. And you'll see their names there. And you'll see them kind of throughout. So one of the things that we learned, again, you might already know this, was there's already knowledge production inside prisons. Inside, you know, your book, Hugo, is very much like there is already rich knowledge production even in really difficult circumstances. So we learned that in 1984, 85, a group of women at Bedford Hills, maximum security, they're spending between 10 and life, these women. Maximum security for men are usually like 20 to life. So there had been a gathering in 1985 because the women were saying, we've all been abused. We've all experienced domestic violence. Domestic violence is the best predictor of who's going to prison, layered with race and class. And so they called a gathering in 1985, a public hearing with state officials, with community activists, and the women testified, they buried in the archives. We only knew it because we were working with women who said, when I first came in, there was this gathering in the cafeteria. And Kathy Boudin, a friend of mine who just passed away, said, I remember I helped make the bleachers. That, and, and every woman who testified was allowed to have one other woman accompany her to the microphone. So there is, this is another part of participatory work. There is already knowledge before we get there. There's a lot of knowledge in communities. In the men's prison, there's a guy named Eddie Ellis. And I say this because these are scholars you should know. Eddie Ellis was accused of being a Black Panther. He was in Greenhaven, and he created the non-traditional approach to criminal and social justice, the Greenhaven think tank. And it was a group of men in Greenhaven prison who did the seven neighborhood study. Eddie went in in the 70s, and by the 80s, New York State prisons had gone from 10,000 to about 70,000. And Eddie was like, where are all these black people coming from? So he did a study from within the prison. So I said to him, he also recently passed away, Eddie, how'd you do that from within the prison? You might call him a guerrilla scholar. Um, he said, you know, a guy named Kenneth Clark. Do you know that name? Kenneth Clark. 
came into the prison. Now, in the US, Kenneth Clark is a very important black psychologist who's seen as a little conservative because he talked about internalization of, um, of white superiority and black inferiority. So he's seen, as, he's seen in a funny way. He was also the major psychologist involved in Brown versus Board of Education, integrating the schools. Did black kids really need to sit next to white kids? So he's been, he's been rolled over the coals a few times. But here I find out that Kenneth Clark, who had this very respectability profession, was in prison and doing this radical work in prison, and nobody knew about it in the academy, right? The kind of split identities, particularly of scholars of color, who maybe still can't do all their community work from within because there are loyalty oaths always of, are you really a researcher or are you dedicated to the community? All right, so we did this amazing very, very traditional research project. We came up with four questions. I'm not going to go through all of them. But what's the impact of college on the women? What's the impact on their kids? What are the recidivism rates? And um, what's the impact on discipline in the organization? The women asked me, because I was the only one on the outside at the time, to go meet with the Black and Latino Caucus in our state legislature, um, to ask them, what evidence do you need to change policy? How can we stop incarcerating? And how can we offer college? And I met with a guy named Jeff Aubrey, who said, black guy from Queens, he said, all my upstate colleagues in the legislature are white. And they see prisons as a way of containing people of color, but also employment upstate. And they're not going to want to give that away. So you have to prove to us that people don't commit another crime, and it's a cost-benefit tax savings. Those were not discourses we wanted to be using. Save your tax dollars. They won't kill again. And yet we had to. And that's what I mean by to whom are you accountable and who are your audiences. All right, we created a, a report that had photos and statistics and public statements of remorse and responsibility by the women. And there were ruptures in our process. And I'm just going to give you a couple of examples and then give two more projects, and then we're out of here. Um, so critical participatory projects are bringing together people who are working across power lines. Have you ever noticed that sometimes when you work across power lines, it's a little dangerous? Anybody? Yeah? Anybody ever make a huge mistake when doing that? Uh, I guess I'm the only one. OK. I appreciate your uh, generous honesty. All right, so at one point, Marie and I, it, we had all gathered interviews from the children, from the correction officers, from the women, from the faculty, and Maria, who was then my student, now my colleague, she and I took it home and we generated codes. And we brought the codes in and said, so what do you think of these codes? And the women said, we collect the data and you do the intellectual work? You're going to decide what the codes are? No, 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 no. That's not how we're rolling. So Judy Clark, who's now out, almost everybody is now out, she said, bring the material. There was no place we could lock the data in the prison, so we brought the material in. We read it together. It took us an extra four months. Their codes were, of course, different than ours, much more informed, much, much more complex. And then the second rupture, there are a million ruptures, a million of mistakes we all made. Um, but at the very end, we were all writing sections of this report. And um, I had written the section on who are we? Because people are often like, I know you say you work with women in prison, but really you're just using them, whatever. So we, I wrote this thing of we're all women, we're all, um, some of us are white and black and immigrant and Jewish, and some of us have cancer, and some of us have children, and some of us are political. Um, the end of the day, some of us get strip searched when we go back to our cells, and some of us just cry on the train on the way home. But um, 
but we're all organized against violence, racial violence, intimate violence, structural violence. And Donna Hilton said, Michelle, you left out the part that some of us killed our kids. And if you leave that out, you're just leaving a huge hole for the people who already hate us to fill in with their own stereotypes. Please, let's say, and some of us made terrible mistakes. And we think about it every day. And we want to reach out to those families, but our lawyers don't want us to. And our children are angry at us. And our mothers are angry at us. And our commitments are to repair the world that we harmed. Let's say that. And there was another rupture moment. I just realized, oh my god, I'm just trying to tell a pretty story about which is my want. Don't ever trust my totally pretty stories. Because my inclination is to want to say, let's tell the story that hasn't been told. And those women taught me two things. Don't romantic they taught me a thousand things, but don't romanticize us, tell the whole story. Tell the whole story. And the second is don't just talk about structures of capitalism and patriarchy and racism, because I also made a decision that my neighbor didn't. And my neighbor also experienced capitalism and racism and patriarchy, and she didn't kill somebody. So I have to take responsibility. And that wasn't like, oh my god, they're taking responsibility and denying structure. They taught me that those things live together that you can actually take responsibility when you understand structure and history, right? Not that in psychology, again, we either do you're resilient or you're broken or you're, you know, or you're strong or you're, or you're damaged. The women were very clear that we can talk about structure and agency in the same sentence without victim blaming. All right, amazing project. Uh, we sent a copy of the report to every state senator in New York, to every governor in the nation. Um, we created postcards that said, get tough on crime, educate men and women in prison. We sent quotes from children saying, I hate college in prison, but now, because now when I go, my mother just wants to talk about books and homework and read together. Another postcard that said, I love college and prison because now I just say, oh, my mom, she's upstate in college. We had a quote from a correction officer who said, I hate this program. I can't afford college for my own kids or me, and they're getting it for free. It wasn't free. There was a small price, but we paid it if somebody couldn't. But I know they're not coming back at night, and I know they're not fighting. Th those kinds of statements that are filled with the complexity and the contradictions became our postcard campaign. We also look for quotes on the back, which was part of PAR. That is, can we get counter narratives from surprising um, allies? And I met this woman, Janice Greishaber, at a, a criminal, criminal legal system gathering. Um, and she was a tough, conservative white woman. Her daughter had been brutally killed in a, in a parking lot. And she was like, tough on crime, and never let them out, and longer sentences. And, and I went up to her after the meeting, and I said, this might be totally offensive. But given that 90% of people are getting out, would you be willing to read this report and perhaps give us a quote for the back? I didn't hear from her for weeks, and then I got this across my email. Educating the incarcerated is not an exercise in futility, nor is it a gift to the undeserving. It's a practical and necessary safeguard to ensure that those who have found themselves without the proper resources to succeed have their needs met before they're released. It's a gift to ourselves and our children, a gift of compassion and peace of mind, we are not turning the other cheek to those who have hurt us. We're taking their hands and filling them with learning so they can't strike again. And I remember when I got it, I, I had like weird stereotypic thoughts about her. And I just cried in the way that maybe you all feel moved and wondered if I would be so generous in the same circumstance. And yet part of 
participatory work is bringing in a kind of solidarity, new allies. I'm going to end talking about changing minds with this slide. One of the things that was so clear, and, and Hugo, I'm, I'm sure this would be true with your work too, is that people who are not so privileged, who are struggling, who are in circumstances that are beyond many of our imaginations, know that we are all entangled. They know that we're connected with the land, with history, with ancestors, and with each other in a way that one of the things I think about white elite psychology, privilege, global north is like we just think we're separate. And we just walk through the world as though we're separate. These women were so acutely aware that we were entangled in solidarities, desired and coerced. So one night, we had a big fundraiser at Lincoln Center, a big fancy um, concert hall in New York. A bunch of famous actresses performed the stories of the women. The, the event was called What I Want My Words to Tell You. And we made a, a lot of money. And the women said, let's give a college scholarship to one of our children. Let's give a college scholarship to the child of a guard. And let's give a, a scholarship to the child of a murder victim. They understood those deep spider webs of survival in a way that it even feels to me like the academy tries to encourage people out of that, right? Um, Karen Barad is a physicist who writes a uh, feminist sociology of sociologists of science who writes about entanglements. And again, you all have lots of indigenous writers who have written this well before Karen Barad. But she would say that every time I inter interact with Poulain, it's not an interaction, it's an intra-action that we're exchanging molecules and electrons and words and love and hearts and words we can't say and ideas. And that if we begin to think about these engagements as intra-actions and not inter-actions. And I would say even from my two sessions with students here that structural marginality awakens a recognition of entanglements. And I think mobility and privilege dissociates us from those entanglements. All right. So new questions emerge. One of the cool things about critical par, like Inside Out, is new stuff just happens. Like first you're doing sanitary napkins, then you're doing books, then you're doing safe space groups, because there's a good karma. Like most of us aren't involved in organizations that have like a rolling desire to sustain, to keep going, an obligation to those who are not yet touched by us. So within a few months of us doing this work, the children of many of the women contacted the women and me and said, we want to do something. So they created an organization called Echoes of Incarceration, and they made films about the impact of mass incarceration on the children. And the first film, and these were kids from 7 to 35. So the first film. It was just like a kid's film. The first part was the moment of the arrest. And four children spoke. I came home and my mom wasn't home. She wasn't home for two weeks. I didn't know what was happening. Second kid spoke. I was staying with my grandmother and I heard her on the phone and she was whispering. A third said, I was there when they came. And they shook our beds and they stripped all of us and I remember it well. Then the second is the first visit when the children are also treated as criminals. And the third is when mom or dad or brother got out. And throughout it, there's like a bird flying over the barbed wire, right? And again, importantly, lots of the children didn't want to interview their own mothers or fathers. They were mad at them. Right, again, I don't want to romanticize any of this, but they did want to tell a story 
about how this system that looks like it's about crime is actually punishing families, children, and communities. Then formerly incarcerated people came to CUNY and they said, we want to document, CUNY is my university, city university in New York, we want to document what it's like to try to go to college after you've been incarcerated, as somebody said, after you're called a bandit. That was language from here. So we did a project called The Gifts You Bring. The gifts they bring to CUNY that we don't know because we don't ask about those histories because those histories are still shrouded in shame. And again, I'm happy to send this all to you. And then most recently, as I said, there was the Survivors Justice Act, this group of women fighting for the rights of survivors. As soon as they got out, the lawyer, it got passed, the lawyer contacted me and said, I need you to help me research this. And I said, get a grant, let's hire 10 women to be co-researchers and pay them. And now we're three years going strong. During 40, 40 people are out, we're, we're having a retreat in a few weeks. Um, the women are gathering narratives, they're writing policy. Um, it, it's an amazing gathering. So new questions erupt. Who can speak? Who must speak? How do we write about the ethics of rage and vulnerability? When we were writing about the college program all together, it was clear at one point that maybe Maria and I, who were not incarcerated, had an obligation to write a separate article about just the structural violence inside prisons without making the women vulnerable. Does that make sense? And so we checked with them. It was when Abu Ghraib had happened, the prison in Iraq where our, our US soldiers were treating people like animals. And the question was, are our prisons like that? And so there was a panel and I was on the panel. And I realized that formerly incarcerated people can't easily speak about prison conditions because they're often on probation or parole. And, and the former guards can't, won't. Even the really nice ones to face one's own moral injury. Um, so Maria and I wrote a piece called Intimate Details about the backstories in the prison. And um, I will confess to you that all the stories came from this one prison, but we placed them all over the country because it was more ethical to lie than to render the women vulnerable. So the women had already paid prices. Their searches were, their cells were searched. Some of them were sent to the Canadian border for no good reason. All right. So echoes, the gifts they bring. We did a long-termers project with a group of eight men and four women. These, the men had served at least 20 years, the women had served at least 10. They wanted to die, because in New York State we have very long sentences. And so we wanted to demonstrate that it's not effective to have long sentences. It kills the soul, it kills families, communities, and it's very expensive frankly, and people get old and sick. and So we did this PAR project. We interviewed 50 long-termers, and then together we analyzed the data. And we looked at one transcript. It was either a very good choice or a bad choice. It was a white man who had served 25 years um, for taking a young boy across state lines, a 16-year-old. Um, to have a sexual relationship. And no remorse, no regret. And we're all reading this. And I can feel the men are like, uh, the men had all been in since they were 17. They were in their 40s. It's so amazing when they're good friends with each other. Some are college professors, they're poets. They work at um, re-entry programs. But they were getting agitated. And then finally somebody said, we got to throw this guy out of our sample. I mean, this guy is sick. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh my God, wait, you're all in for murder? And he said, okay, keep your mouth shut and let this play out. Um, and then somebody else said, yeah, I mean, uh, this isn't the typical, we can't have, aren't we doing this research to make us look good? And then Pat, a woman said, we're not throwing him out. 
So the minute we throw him out of the, out of the sample, I'm next, because I'm in for a child-related crime. We're all in it. We're all in as long-termers, and we can write about remorse and responsibility and care, but we're not going to exclude anybody. So that was an article in the Journal of Social Issues. Um, I'm going to flip through this quickly. We went on TV, Sharon White, Kate Mogulescu, the lawyer. Sharon is formerly incarcerated. She runs something called Beyond Rosie. Um, and to get young women out of prison. Went on a public TV show to talk about the work. And three weeks later, the woman who ran the show sent us that painting. A guy in Sing Sing, maximum security men's prison, painted that for Sharon and sent it to her to save her sisters from prison and from domestic violence. And so the kind of tendrils of this work flow expansively. Last thing I just want to say, I'm not going to do any of that, none of that. I want to say that my old lady friend, Maxine Green, passed away philosopher. She, she demanded that those of us both in education and research engage in work that's aesthetic and not anesthetic, that provokes new awakenings, that insists on action. And she worried just before she died that our schools were anesthetizing. I sometimes worry that our research is anesthetizing, right? It's putting us to sleep. It's stopping us from seeing the rage, the passion, the joy, the desire. and so. So we need to anticipate that your work and my work will get consumed with colonial appetite. It'll get turned into something we didn't intend. And so maybe we need to write that in our scholarship. Maybe we need a little section that says, please don't read this in the following ways. Or like on cigarettes, on the sides of cigarettes, like warning. This could be bad for you. Please don't pour this into your already racist, homophobic, whatever lens. But I want us to think about, do we have good examples of aesthetic awakenings? And we do. So W.E.B. Du Bois, 1900. Look online, there is a book of his, he took all of his analysis of the American Negro, and he turned them into both beautiful art so like the red might be farmers and the yellow might be cattle ranchers of the economic, political, social existence of um, US African Americans. He also developed a parade genre. So he performed, he had something called the Stars of Ethiopia, where he performed black history on the streets in the communities he most cared about. He didn't do that because he wanted to be an actor. He did that because he wanted to reach the people he most cared about who had been denied the right to read. So he's, he was thinking about this 1900s. Again, I'm sure you have a million examples from your own community. In, um, in Australia, our colleague Christopher Son is working with communities on podcasts and performances with activists and artists. In New York City, see this, Brett Stout took a map of New York City and somehow statistically ran all the NYPD data of innocent stops, right? So you get stopped, the cops hassle you, they might throw you on the ground. My nephew, who's black, has a chip to, right? That you, your body's carrying evidence and then they say, go, be happy to go. So Brett did that in real time, and at the end, he shows where are the black and blue marks of police violence, communities that have been over-policed with no, with, without arrest. We make t-shirts. Why, why do I always fit the description? 
We took the qualitative data, we went back to the community. This woman became Jackie Robinson, one of the lead researchers, became one of the lead plaintiffs in a lawsuit in uh, New York City about, it was called Stop and Frisk. But I have one of those in my office. It's like a little kid's t-shirt that says, why do I always fit the description? We, they even went back, so they, Yankee Stadium, people know Yankee Stadium? It's this big, expensive, very expensive, mostly white people go there and drink a lot, drink a lot. So they made it, and that looks like the Yankee thing, but it says no broken windows. After stop and frisk was found to be illegal in the courts, they just kept doing it, but now they call it broken windows. So if you can take care of a broken window in your community by criminalizing people, they won't kill you. It's that crazy, slippery slope. So they, an artist just came into our life, good karma for all these projects, and made a no broken windows card. And on the inside, it had a picture of some of our researchers. And it was a letter to the Yankee fans. Dear Yankee fans, welcome to the South Bronx. We know you've heard a lot about our neighborhood, but we live here. And we want you to know what the police statistics are. And so then they give them. And we want you to know that we've noticed you drink a lot of beer. We just drink coffee and get stopped by the police, but keep drinking your beer. But please know that you're in our neighborhood. And so they thought about how do we get to privileged audiences as well? And I will end with our own Puleng Sakhalo, who you know has developed an incredible, incredible method of inviting embroidery collectives to document, in this case, the experiences of black women during the apartheid struggle. She's now doing work with black women and obstetric violence, using violence collectives to produce the stories that need to circulate, and that's all I got for now. Thank you all. My friends, you want me to sit up here? Or, yeah? Sure, ladies and gentlemen. Please, let's give Michelle another round of applause. You've left us with a lot. Um, I'm, I'm not even going to try and, and summarize or offer my thoughts because I have a lot of thoughts. I have a lot of thoughts that the pain, the injustice, all of that lives in our bodies, uh, the ruptures that you speak about. Um, but I'm not going to go into all of that, ladies and gentlemen, because we have our colleagues who are going to offer their reflections and their thoughts on Professor Michelle Fine's brilliant, brilliant lecture this afternoon. And first, I'm going to call Professor Hugo Gakenham. He is a writer and a professor here at UNISA at the Institute for Social and Health Sciences. His work is located along the fault lines of black studies, African feminism, African and queer theorizations. He studies the phenomenology of living at the margins of human value, suffering and death. His work is invested in detonating the binaries between the human and the natural, multi-species world. It may be understood within the interdisciplinary framework of black planetary studies. His latest book that Michelle also referred to and you must get a copy. Reich's Death Space is published by Duke University Press and co-published by Vets University Press. Ladies and gentlemen, Hugo Kakanem. Thank you very much. Um, our distinguished guest, Professor Fine, our executive dean of the College of Human Sciences, Prof Ngosi, Prof Tlabangane, Prof Sahada, our host, and the gracious and committed audience that attends a lecture on a Friday afternoon, um, among whom is 
David Sir, whose work, you know, in the lead up to this we were chatting about that I find equally fascinating uh, uh, to yours, uh, Prof. Fine. So I'm excited to respond to Prof. Fine's lecture this afternoon because I have admired her work ever since I first heard of the concept of critical participation research. When I visited CUNY in December 2016, the first thing I wanted to hear about was the public science project and the modest justice project that I had been teaching over several years through the Illuminator video of the Stop and Frisk initiative that you spoke about this afternoon. Um, on my first day at CUNY, Prof. Fine's colleagues, Professors Maria Torre and Brett Stout, had just returned from a court hearing where they were accompanying a woman from the Bronx whose son had been tried for gang violence. In my observation, they were practicing epistemic justice as scholarly accompaniment in how they do their research, how they stay in community and in their theoretical commitments to justice. Prof. Zichado's introduction of Prof. Fine illustrates this work of witnessing, bearing witness to people, right, um, which departs from the tradition of extractive data that is so much easier to do, um, but so unethical, even when it passes the ethical hoops of our ethics committees. Um, so staying in community, as we have heard, is a catalog of joys, struggles, ruptures, and heartbreaks that accompany critical participatory action research rooted in public institutions, that are unapologetically participating in white supremacist, eugenic, and capitalist logics. Profine has also catalogued an ethic of care. This is an incredibly difficult exercise. The researcher does not only extract data in terms of words and questionnaires, but sits with fraught relationships, tears, sighs, expectations of people, disappointments, and sometimes, and only sometimes, I think, great joy. This lecture energizes us intellectually, but also galvanizes us to stay in the trenches of our political commitments in a world of growing precarity, characterized by racial capitalism, patriarchal violence, and rabid subterranean racism. What we know about the penal system that is that it's not for rehabilitation. It is punitive and many times wrongly so. People often emerge as hardened criminals when they had been tried for relatively minor offenses. Most of those incarcerated are black in the US system, black and Hispanic. To continue to shine the spotlight on hidden populations is to practice an ethic of care for both the incarcerated and their families. It is to contest the consensus of injustice. In our own context in South Africa, where we are often unhappy about the length of prison sentences, we think they are too short, profound things they are too long. Uh, the constitutional scrapping of the apartheid system of capital punishment, right? Many of us long for capital punishment even though it was actually an apartheid system that was unjust, and the orientation towards rehabilitation as researchers, what is our obligation to care? Do we have roles towards crafting and developing a more caring political narrative for victims of violence, but also for those incarcerated for violence? How might we do this with prisoners rather than for them? Um, and we've seen the modeling of how this might be in our context. Is it possible to abolish the prison industrial complex in our location? Do we want it? Um, local activists will know more about, will have stronger feelings about this. Those of us who have been to Rwanda, and I am one of them, I know that Jill, uh, you've been to Rwanda a few times, we always remark on the cleanliness in Rwanda and the feeling of safety when you walk in the streets, 
uh, I remarked on this way I would encounter a woman walking alone at 10 o'clock at night. But then today we learn that it has an incarceration rate second only to the United States. And the penny also drops as to why the UK entered into an MOU with Rwanda to imprison unwanted immigrants. Do we want cleanliness and peace if it is at this cost? If I may, I'm going to step away from the penal system for a minute to think about the urgency of scholarly and political solidarity, to center how logics of death home in the black world with a particular ferocity. And I'm going to read an excerpt of my own work on an occasion for you, uh, but this, so, of something I wrote at the beginning of COVID-19. Black bodies have been the site of devastation for centuries. We who inhabit and love these bodies live in a state of perpetual mourning. We mourn the disproportionate dying in our families, communities, and the dying in the black diaspora. We are yet to come to terms with the death that accompanied the AIDS pandemic. Tuberculosis breeds in the conditions within which most of us live. We die from hours spent in the belly of the earth where we dig for minerals to feed the unquenchable thirst of capital. Malaria targets our neighbors with deadly accuracy in Mozambique. Ebola stalks West Africa where it has established itself as a rapacious black disease that kills us. In the black diaspora, African Americans are walking targets for American police who kill and imprison them at rates that have created a prison industrial complex. Africans die in the Mediterranean Ocean and join the spirits of ancestors drowned centuries ago. So I bring this into our conversation this afternoon, not because it's particularly useful for advancing the discussion on participatory action research, but to expand our parameters of care. What Catherine McKittrick, McKittrick calls livingness, right? Um, to think with livingness in relation to survivance, which is a concept that Profine raised just now, and what she calls livingness on demonic ground, right? This ability to insist on living with a dignity even when the ground on which you stand is meant to kill you. So I've de developed a strange habit. Uh, every morning I check how many Africans have drowned in our North African oceans trying to reach Europe while escaping the horrors of home. It's strange because it's also so far away when, when there's death right here, right? But I also think about this, in, this need to, to depart from home and I, in relation to what it means for South Africans who repel Zimbabwean neighbors attempting to escape hunger in search of freedom. What does it mean for our freedom-bound movements to be repelled both now and in the deep past? To care this way is to think historically, to surface how the prison industrial complex latches onto plantation logic that sought to subjugate and control for profit, right, always for profit. It compels us to work in solidarity to see connections across space and temporality. Since structural inequality patterns on history, I'm drawn to participatory action research for its ability to tease out the legacies of patriarchy, racism, and capitalism which continue to marginalize majority populations in the global south. The method proves to be ethically robust in the ways that appeal to me in relation to what's ethical. Uh, Profine tells us that it promotes solidarity, ethical witnessing, and accompaniment. It builds horizontal relationships. It teaches research skills to communities that are not trained in research skills. And it often is empowering in form and in outcome. When I taught research methods, I used to ask my students to critique PAR. Even though Profine advocates for it, she and her colleagues also critique it. So my students would use Maria Torre's piece to critique the method. <coughs> One of the critiques is the length of time that it takes, right? And the example you gave was how the woman wanted to analyze the data themselves, right? And that delayed you another four months. Uh, and yet, clearly, Profine is a prolific writer, a rated scientist. Um, so 
it's possible, and I'd like to possibly, if we have time for a response, know, you know, like, like how do you manage to, to write in such when, when the very method forces you to slow down? But I can imagine what's productive and generative about slowing down. So I close by expressing my gratitude then to Prof Fine for re-energizing us for the long road ahead and for reigniting our care for incarcerated and neglected communities buried deep in a superstructure of global racial capitalism. Thank you very much. Sure, thank you so much, Professor Kahneman. This idea of slowing down when one is always racing against time because you need research outputs. So if it's going to take you four, six months to sit and think and analyze together, what does that mean when the system says you also need to publish? And this is something that our next speaker, Prof. Nokutura Shabangan, always speaks about to say, but policies don't come from nowhere. We are the ones who make these policies. So as we rethink the ways that we do the work that we do, we should not allow ourselves to be confined by these policies because that in itself is violent. Ladies and gentlemen, Noktula Shabangani was awarded her PhD in anthropology by the University of the Verdwaters Front in 2012. Her thesis is entitled The Political Economy of Teenage Sexuality in the Era of HIV and AIDS, a Case of Soweto. It was through this work that her journey of engaging in the philosophy of knowledge and the attendant politics began. She draws from a wide range of literature to think about phenomena in all their complexity. To borrow from Linda Tuchiwai Smith, she also, she is also hard pressed to name a discrete area of interest. She, like Linda Tokiwai Smith, finds that she's more seized by the need to research research. Hope you get that. She's acutely aware of the stated and understated politics of research. In this sense, the idea of voice takes a differently nuanced shape. For her, voice is not about what the people said. It is also about what they have not said, cannot say, isn't sayable, when filtered through the ubiquitous framework of Eurocentricity. Her ethics are about redress and restoration as she has a vested interest in bringing to sharp conversation the knowledge systems heretofore relegated to the margins of the mainstream. She has written on subjects as diverse as social, epistemic, and ethical justice, community and youth development, knowledge production from an Afrocentric purview, and on issues of pedagogy. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Shabangan. I shall not ask how it is that I find myself here, but here I am. I said upon receiving this invitation that the question of situating myself is one that I do not take lightly, precisely because the work that I do, I do not from an academic standpoint. Michelle has said professor and couldn't quite come to the enunciation of the people with whom I work and that then means that I need to restore the balance that I have since lost. Once upon a time I did sit 
on the floor and communed with the land while I was ushered in to this very royal saying, O Shabangani, O Makalela Castle in Jingongonyama, O Shabangani Limshop in Jingis Shabatis or Lanji, Bonabangan and Okune Manzini, Bapumana Luvuta Futi. By the same token, I am born of uh, people who also claim oneness with the land, Oskosana. Omusigam Shang, Omahong Latin Jenges Lani, is this was on Kesa Bigelan as a Buzano Gutini Le, what you are whom Sigam Shang, Inguazi, Aquas, Inguazi Kijima. My ancestors, because of those attributes, can never be conceived of as gentlemen, and by the same token, I cannot be thought of as a lady. In other words, Shabangani. When you say Shabangani, you're asking, what spear do you use? What choice of spear do you use for the war that always finds you? I don't invite it. <laughs> I don't invite it. It finds me. It finds me in the name that I bear, Noctula, which I've been told that uh, perhaps I need to be more peaceful than I am. <laughs> And uh, along the way, I did find a, reto a, a retort to say that in an unjust world, it is only foolhardy to be peaceful because when you are peaceful in an unjust world, you are only cementing and normalizing the injustice. So colleagues, I am here and um, I take it as a singular uh, responsibility and honor to be in conversation with all of you using as a vessel for our deep reflections as this our country that does need for us to find one another to find a language that transcends that which we are currently uh, working with through Prof um, Fine and by that same token in that same breath, I wish to congratulate you, Prof, for this um, accolade that brings you here this afternoon, and to also acknowledge um, the College of Human Sciences under the leadership of Prof Ngosi and Prof Sehalo for, for bringing her over. I heard from uh, my fellow uh, traveler, Prof Hugo Agakanham, that we could have been at Kuni at the same time of December 2016. Yes. So from that point of view, I'm also really um, provoked to say that Kuni has been a friend to UNISA. Um, we have hosted the likes of Linda Alkoff, who writes very, very eloquently about the problem of speaking for others. And on that occasion, Josephine, you were there. When you were there, when you were there, we had this um, thing that never happens, seldom happens in South Africa, where the lens was turned, where we were able to look at whiteness through the petri dish that blackness is always subjected to. And uh, we relished that. So I understand why research is such a, it's such a, um, favorite thing that we do. Uh, we, 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 were, uh, we got a taste of that uh, through uh, the work of Linda Alkoff, as well as that we were really um, heartbroken at the passing of Charles, Smith, Charles Mills, whom we also hosted. And I remember vividly saying to Prof that, you know, Prof, when you see us go helter and skelter, during your presentation, I think we are only using you as a conduit to those conversations that in South Africa we don't have yet, we urgently need to have. And for that reason, when people like yourselves make it to our shores, once again, we remember that in fact there are conversations that we necessarily have to have and those conversations do not, um, can no longer be conversations as usual. You come to us a profile during the week of Marikana. 
you come to us during what is called the Women's Month, and I'm trying to understand do the women of the widows of Marikana also see themselves in this thing that we are being given and that we are normalizing to say it is the week of uh, the month of women, when in fact women are known to, to do more than uh, what um, is being celebrated through this one day and one month. Women are known to do more than seek a validation in a colonial system. Women of this country and women elsewhere are known to bath in their own blood routinely. Women are known to, to turn water into bones. Women are known as alchemists who turn a blood into milk. So women do deserve to be celebrated all the time and in ways that go beyond the way we are doing it uh, as a country. And I think that as scholars, we, all, we really bear the responsibility to question this taken for granted commonsensical uh, uh, um, uh, celebrations that we are uh, uh, receiving without uh, the necessary suspicion from the powers that be. I also greet you, Prof. And yes, your book has, uh, is a timely one and one that uh, we indeed need to visit. And uh, I also greet all of you, my Africa Matle, as well as uh, colleagues in our midst. We demand an end to the war against black people. Since this country's inception, there have been na named and unnamed wars on our communities. We demand an end to the criminalization, incarceration, and killing of our people. And this statement I took uh, this morning from Maldonado Torres's 10 thesis that were inspired during his own visit to this country. And he has since become a regular um, that we, we, we are thinking uh, through and uh, thinking with. And I, I want to say that I'm very cognizant of the fact that in one breath, it is said we demand an end to the criminalization, the incarceration and killing of our, our, of our people. In other words, how do we uh, understand incarceration without the routine in cr criminalization of ourselves, of our hair, of uh, uh, our bodies, our accents, and everything else to the extent then that we can then uh, expand the contours of what it means to be in a state of anti-blackness in a, in a country that um, uh, is routinely violent against black bodies. To be that black lives are in jeopardy in this um, dispensation, in this civilization of death that has, be, has visited us since time immemorial. But uh, in the same vein, I also want to pay tribute to the fact that a new civilization is training at the Sims, a new civilization is gonna take place either with or without the help of the academy. <laughs> a new civilization is on its way as the universe and the cosmos begins to write that, he, that which has been wrong uh, um, in so many levels. Here I have uh, this idea that an, an, an ever ending war is perpetuated against um, black bodies in research in, uh, on our ways of knowing and the values that we hold therein, in how we choose to live our lives, in our birthing practices. <laughs> Just being born <laughs> is a violent experience, you know, uh, for many of us. In death and funerary rites, the violence doesn't end when we die. Uh, in education, our students uh, all tell us all the time that this education system is bearing them down. It is uh, um, uh, detracting from their own uh, self, 
and it is thus violent. In the spirituality that uh, we necessarily need to uh, give expression to as we come to the world in the most natural way that we know how. And that, this being the case then, how, how do we then foist uh, incarceration as not part of a whole apparatus of war that has, of war that has been domesticated and rendered benign in small and, and, and little ways through the very research that we do. So um, I'm going to stay with only two ideas in, in the um, title that you, 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 you propose, Prof. The idea of epistemic justice and radical rapture. And Prof. Ngozi said it's <laughs> the, red, the, the rapture. So let's, let's, let's see how, how I, I measure up against that. Um, in, in my understanding, you know, I, I try to do scholarship the way I know how without um, borrowing from a, a template that uh, I find to be violent. And so my understanding of epistemic justice using this language that I would not be using at this time of day had I not uh, been uh, here is to say that it is the ways of knowing that lay bare the constellation of historical events that spawned a particular set of circumstances. To, to lay bare the constellation of historical events that spawned a particular set of circumstances and in this way begins to account for this peculiar civilization. Well beyond the data that we are known for, well beyond the discrete theoretical frameworks uh, and, and the findings and conclusion that do not make these constellations uh, apparent. So the question arises, how far in history do we go to make good of this obligation to begin to lay bare this constellation of event, historical events that has given us this particular uh, um, uh, civilization? And um, I'm going to quote from Ramos. He said, to the very beginning, to the very beginning, we go to the very beginning of this civilization that occasion must a uh, dispossession of self and everything. Uh, this uh, very um, uh, 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 civilization that is uh, supposedly about a discovery of what is called a new world. And in my view, that then begins to do what you are enjoining us to do, Prof, to tell the whole story. In this way, the sweep is aggressive as it implicates both the spectacular and mundane. This entails that we understand not only the state, but also the deep state that understood in another way necessarily implicates what has been called the colonial matrix of power by the likes of Ngovugajeni with the education, the education system that we are custodians of, that we are interlocutors of, that we are advocates of, firmly implicated. You ask us a question, Prof. You ask the question, when are we ever complicit in, 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 in in, in, in the set of circumstances that you so eloquently uh, expose us to. And my response is that we are complicit when you do not ask the questions that matter and in their complexity. When our scholarship in this instance does not do what Minolo advocated, that we do not only change the conversation, but the very assumptions that inform the conversation. What does this mean? It means that we look at a situation such as incarceration not as a given, but as understanding that it is part and parcel of what indigenous, indigenous people the world over has characterized as the setting of their sun. A cold place, a scary place, a place of routinized death, when, when age old, uh, as well, I look at this as um, uh, uh, this complicity. When age old epochal civiliz civilizational questions are broken down to new questions that are not connected back to the routinized death, as though they are questions all by themselves and they could be understood in their discreteness. Uh, what I'm advocating here is that we move 
well beyond the data, move well beyond the conceptual frameworks, move, move well beyond the, the conclusions that are implied by the data, and begin to do this deep questioning about this very civilization that we find ourselves in. A civilization that has been couched as one of death, one that does not respect um, beast or man. To be complicit means that we adopt a simplistic view that uh, some are by virtue of their incarceration guilty and that the apparatus that pronounce their guilt is by implication not only innocent but legitimate. We are complicit when we do not contend with the weight of blackness in an anti-black world when we do not contend with, the particular, with this particular civilization as a civilization of death, and we seek to redeem and whitewash it somehow. It means that we, it, this means that we continue to ask, whose way of being in the world has given us this institutionalized uh, uh, way of uh, dealing with punishment? Who's, uh, what is it invo informed by? What values inform this uh, way of being in the world? And what bigger agendas does it serve? It means that we do not devolve, uh, when we are complicit, it means that we do not devolve this kind of thinking to students. That rather we normalize the neoliberal view of individual guilt against a set of tangible and spectacular violences against uh, the, as opposed to the ubiquitous has a violence that makes the fabric of black lives. Bigo famously reminds us that any black child who survives to adulthood is indeed a miracle, given the webs of entanglement, all of which are designed to snuff life even before it begins. I want to ask who then is incarcerated when a whole family burns in a blaze of fire? Something that we know, I dread winter, because in winter, whole families perish in, in, in a place of fire, and we've become very desensitized to that. They are only seen that they are born black, landless, and with a basic need for warmth. Who is incarcerated when children drown on their way to school because the makeshift bridge that the community put would not hold? How are we complicit when we utter messages of commiseration without the necessary rage? When we do not use our affinity for, with words to sensitize communities that this was at, utterly unnecessary had black lives had more currency than is the case? How are we complicit when our research is thick on scientificity but thin on the human edge to rebel against a system that is designed to exceptionalize a few at the expense of the many. Indeed, the question of how we are complicit is an important one and an urgent one, and that we are not asking it is but a glimpse of the stakes to which we account as a community. Such deaths that no one accounts for remain accidental and incidental and are fodder for our research uh, interests and um, we s somehow divorce them from the logical outside of the parasite of genocide that has visited indigenous people the world over. I can stop at this point unless um, perhaps let me see if I can maybe uh, two points that I've skipped a whole section, to say that uh, this idea of no research on us without us perhaps uh, needs deeper questions about reckoning together in ways that do not take for granted the quality, quantity methodologies that we have been bequeathed with. But those that allow all of us to descend to the pits of hell reckon with one another in, 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 in all truth and honesty, and in that reckoning also invoke the ancestors. You say, Prof, that we, you guess charm, we guess charm towards but never fully realize democratic and decolonizing knowledge production. I saw through this uh, response, I sought to suggest some of the ways that we can move towards the radical raptures that you invoke 
in, in the short time that has been afforded to me, uh, and I agree that it is a journey, but I also want to say it is one that we can no longer uh, um, treat uh, uh, you know, with uh, lightness and without the necessary weight and, and respect. Because at the end of the day, these are not academic questions. These are questions about life and death. These are questions about routinized death. These are questions about dispossession. These are questions about what is it that we teach when we have a whole generation to socialize. And should you ask who do we account to, and I want to invoke Amilka Cabral to say that that, who enjoins us that we must act as if we answer to and only to our ancestors, our children, and the unborn. Anything else does not matter. Thank you. I feel like there's never enough time for such very deep, important debates. Uh, time is always the enemy. I'm aware that we are running uh, behind <laughs> schedule a little bit, um, but also Prof. Lamangan, you know the Chief Albert Lutuli Chair often hosts regular webinars and seminars, so hint, hint, an invite will come. So colleagues, you might have questions and comments. I'm inviting you to the webinar where Prof. Lamangan will be presenting, and then we can continue the conversation. Um, I'm just going to allow two, only two, because this is also a moment where we want to celebrate uh, Prof. Michelle Fine, and we would like to have a moment to do that. So I'm going to please ask for indulgence for another 15 or so minutes with us, please. Um, there's one. Is there anybody else? Okay, so we'll just have that one comment. Yes, Thank you ahead. very much for um, your talk, as well as the responses. And I think that it was the last response that made me brave enough to ask a question. So, Cesar um, Sabangawe, I wanted to ask about abolition and carcerality. You mentioned abolition very briefly at the beginning. And I wanted to ask, especially after the elaboration which has got about the state, the anti black an anti-black world, I wanted to ask what you, as well as the other prison intellectuals you work with, as well as other incarcerated persons, conceive of abolition as, whether it is prison abolition or abolition of the anti-black world, and I suppose how you canvas and navigate through the necessity and temporality of both. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to give Michelle the opportunity to respond to that and then just uh, brief closing remarks, and then we can move to. Let me just say thank you to both of you. It, um, I, I feel very emotional by the conversation we've had. Um, I think you did too. And. Um, and both the deep questions you're asking of all of our work and naming the obligations of the academy in, um, we would say in the states, in the aftermath of slavery and the presence of continued anti-black violence, to use um, Hugo's language to think through how do we not notice, how are we not obligated to contend the anti-black violence and the social death, even in institutions we think are preparing the next generation, or maybe particularly. Um, I love that you both kind of expanded prisons to sit in a larger network of institutions produced by a not only a carceral logic, but a colonial logic, a containment logic. And so what's our obligation to critique within each, but not separate them from each other to create? Your language was incredible. Um, the, the large constellations right, of, of bits of life that we need to connect. We need to make it clear that interrogations in prisons and interrogations in anti-black violence and what you wake up every morning, Hugo, to do, which is to calculate the dead bodies in the sea, that those are, those are related. 
Those are not separate events and we shouldn't imagine them to be separate. Um, so thank you both for a conversation forever that will last a lifetime. I want to say that. I also want to say UNISA is an incredibly important institution in struggle. CUNY is an incredibly important institution in struggle. And we should figure out how to, how to make that a solidarity struggle. You've got incredible colleagues. You have incredible faculty, amazing students, deep reach. And, and it, it pains me that institutions that have a radical commitment are also the ones who are struggling. You know, Harvard can now afford to give everybody free tuition even if they don't take their legacy babies. But the schools that have stretched toward a much more radical view of access and transformation, access is not enough. I think, Nathuli, you made that clear. Like, we could reach a lot of people with education and pour terrible colonial knowledge down their throat and create a kind of violence. So what happens after access? What's our obligation to decolonize, to Africanize, to imagine communities as universities, not just universities as communities? I'm getting to abolition. I am not ignoring you. There's one more thing I want to say. If Lucas Mamabola is in the world, is he here? Oh my God, I love you. <laughs> Lucas, so poor Lucas Mamabola took my CV and had to pour it into those girdles of the NRF or the, yeah. Thank you, thank you, I owe you forever. Come to New York, dinner's on me. <laughs> you were amazing and I know we had many, many, probably two years worth of email exchanges, is that right? I mean, you and I are intimate in, uh, about wonderful conversations and creepy and I have gotten to read your own work and you are a brilliant, loving scholar carving new pathways. So I thank you, Lucas. I'm so glad you're here. To abolition. You, you don't get that rating without a Lucas. You and I should share it, right? Um, to abolition. So there is a large and important abolition movement in the States that's about prisons, it's about universities. It's about public institutions, and it is forcing a conversation that takes state violence seriously, that takes racialized consequences seriously. And the simple version is close all the prisons and bring all the people home. That's not what the, that's the, the right wing distortion of the abolition conversation. But it is an invitation for, for diverse dialogues in communities, what else would we do to bring dignity, to bring justice, to recognize harm, to recognize accountability? The questions Nuthulu asked about who's responsible for that bridge, who's responsible for the dead bodies in the sea, we're not criminalizing those people, right? We're criminalizing kids on the street who do things we wish they wouldn't or, but you totally get it. We are so downstream in how we criminalize. You see it in the US, we won't talk about white terrorists. We won't talk about domestic terrorism, we'll talk about Muslim terrorists, we'll talk about black terrorism, but we can't put those words together. So abolition is a radical invitation to imagine what else is possible. For a while, our group was saying, when a woman commits a murder, send her to college. Send her to college. So we, women have one murder in our body in case anyone said, we don't do it again. Locking someone up, I know the families of the dead might want that. I, I totally get that. And then when women cut themselves, we put them in solitary confinement. The, the idea that this is rehabilitative, good for those people, good for their families, or good for any of us, is, is such a distortion. And so abolition is a radical invitation. Angela Davis speaks about it. Miriam Acaba speak about it. What would we put in place 
if we did close the prisons. Many of the formerly incarcerated women that I work with will say, I'm not a total abolitionist. They'll say, some people need to go away. They might not need to go to prison, but they need to maybe be out of their communities for a bit. Navajo feminists have taken up restorative justice. When a man commits domestic violence against a woman, the elders go to his workplace and say, you have violated our entire community. We're going to escort you off the reservation. We're going to work with you there. And then when you are healed and we are healed, we will have a conversation and we will invite you back home. It's not a banishment. So we need to be thinking of alternatives. In, in the States, some people are saying, when someone is mentally ill and screaming on the subway, don't call the police. Call mental health practice. We need to reimagine and not ignore the harms, not ignore the accountabilities, but rebuild a humanity that understands how do we all heal together? How do we take seriously that we're entangled? Your, your conversation about Rwanda, <laughs> that it looks so safe, I get that, but there's just a backstory we need to know. Neighborhoods in the states, you know, it's not the black neighborhoods that are being hyper-policed alone. It's the white neighborhoods where the police are protecting white people and buildings from black youth. And we all stand around photographing. Thank goodness for the video cameras. But um, so abolition is, is an invitation to imagine what else is possible, as well as a real commitment to decarcerating and to think through the categories of decarceration. Old, there's a movement called RAP, releasing aging prisoners. Now, there are so many old women and men, older than me, in their 70s. Who is that serving? But even with the young people, are there alternatives? Um, so nobody's running from harm and accountability, but we are running toward structural, elite, corporate, capitalist accountability as well. And when Donald Trump goes to prison, nobody's going to say, let's abolish the prison. <laughs> so, thank you all. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Professor Fine. When Prof. Labangan was talking about civilizations and us having to go back, when you make the example of the Navajo people, it resonates because even in the African communities and our cultures, in how people who had done wrong in the community uh, were dealt with. It was never, we, we know it's a colonial project, we know it's a capitalist project, and, and that's why more and more black people are put into prisons. But if we go back and actually challenge the system with the work that we're doing, perhaps uh, something different can be possible. I'm going to call uh, Professor Zetu, our executive dean, to come and join me. Uh, here and um, Prof. As we also, if you can also come and join me here as well, please. I'm going to give Professor Ngosi the opportunity to just say a few words and then um, to hand over the special token of appreciation, but to also uh, to speak a bit about the NRA. Okay. <laughs> you know when you're, you're hijacked on stage, you start like this. Uh, go ask. Uh, uh, we are so grateful as the College of Human Sciences. It's long we've been struggling. It's long we've just been saying, ah, it's only the CC rating, NRFC rating. But now, I have the honor to introduce to you our female A-rated researcher, Professor Fine. It's Michelle Mamabolo Fine. 
<laughs> yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your support. Oh, this is so On behalf of the College of Human Sciences, the Chief Albert Lutuli Chair, the Inside Outside Project, the UNISA community, we just want to say thank you very much for gracing our chance and sharing with us your intellectual mm. gift. Thank you. thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you join us, please? Oh, yeah, you get some choose. Oh. <laughs> I have to go. My grandson is waiting for me. Yeah. <laughs> gentlemen, I'm going to call Dr. Ngohwane, who is uh, a member of the executive management of the Department of Psychology, to offer us the vote of thanks and closing remarks, after which we are all invited to refreshments and continue networking outside. Dr. Ngohwane. Thank you so much. Um, Prof. Sikhalo, thank you so much for this great opportunity. I'm really humbled um, to offer the closing remarks in this very prestigious um, public lecture. And once again, um, congratulations, uh, Prof. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, esteemed speakers, participants, and honored guests, our exploration of how fairness in knowledge and complexities of prison systems interact has been very enlightening today. This has been a very enlightening journey. Through a meaningful discussion and valuable insights, we've gained a better grasp of the problems and the possible solutions in these areas. At the very core of the heart of our deliberations lies the concept of epistemic justice a beacon that advocates for the equal and fair access to knowledge and the validation of diverse perspectives. Yet this noble ideal has grappled with the formidable hurdles posed by society, heavily reliant on the mechanisms of incarceration and punishment. As we approach the culmination of this discourse, it is crucial to pause and reflect on the profound depths we have plumbed and denounced its layers we have uncovered. Now, in the pursuit of knowledge, we have encountered moments of immense joy that highlight the transformative power of epistemic justice within the very fabric of carceral state. These instances serve as beacons of hope, illuminating power narratives where marginalized voices transcend the shadows, the educational opportunities, 
thrive within confinement constraints, and the dissemination of knowledge bridge gaps the society seeks to widen. These moments stand as testament to the spirit of humanity, a spirit that even when we are faced with adversity can flourish, we know that we can flourish and aspire transformation. In the same breath, our exploration has led us to stark realities of heartbreak, these instances where the promise of equitable knowledge dissemination is met with resistance, suppression, and the unsettling silence of marginalized voices. Within the walls of incarcerated communities where access to education is still limited, voices are stifled. These heartbreaks act as urgent calls to action. They compel us to share and to shatter the status quo, foster systemic change, and dismantle the very structures that perpetuate inequity. Integral to, to our discourse has been the concept of radical ruptures, a notion that carries within the seed of transformative change. It embodies the potential for revolutionary shifts in how knowledge is valued, how knowledge is shared, and how it's distributed within the very framework of carceral state. The concept envisions the future abandoned by the weight of unjust systems, and it instills hope in the possibility of cultivating inclusive epistemologies that empower us and elevate. As we prepare to close this public lecture, let us not merely part ways, but instead shoulder the collective weight of our newfound insight, of our shared experiences and shared knowledge. May our departure from this discourse mark the commencement of our roles as advocates, as change makers, as supporters of epi epi epistemic justice. The path that lies ahead us encourages us to remain unwavering in our commitment to drive change, forging meaningful connections and pushing the boundaries of what is achievable. With that being said, ladies and gentlemen, I would like, I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to Prof. Zetun Gossi, the Executive Dean of the College of Human Sciences, who is welcoming and opening remarks set the stage and set a context for our journey. Prof, your words have provided, provided us with a guiding light, steering us through the intricate nuances in our, of our exploration. A special note of appreciation goes to those who have enriched our discourse with intellectual pros and unwavering commitment to justice. Prof, Michelle Fine, a distinguished professor your presentation has been a, a beacon of wisdom, shining light to our complexities of epistemic justice within the context of uh, carceral state. Your contribution has sparked discussions, ignited contemplations, fostered a deeper understanding of this subject matter. We also, we are grateful also to Prof. Hugo Kenham, your insightful response following the keynote address has not only added layers of depth to our discussions, but it has also inspired us to be critical in our thought and also in our introspections. Our heartfelt um, extend to Prof. Nogutula Tlavangwani, your thoughtful response has contributed to a very holistic nature of our discussions and also inviting us to view the subject matter through multiple lens and fostering a very comprehensive um, reflection. To each and every one of you who has attended this very prestigious lecturer, we thank you for um, being in this lecture today and participating in your own ways, even though you were only given two questions. <laughs> But I do believe that there is some internal reflections that is happening in the conversations that will continue online as we know that we are an online university. 
behind the scenes, the dedicated team that had worked very hard to make sure that this program is successful, um, also managing the technical and the logistical issues to make sure that we have Prof. Fine here and also other, um, other speakers as well. So in closing, I express my deepest gratitude to each and every one of you for engaging in discussions, for reflecting, for our presenters who have shown, who has given us very illuminating perspectives, and also your commitment outside of this public lecture to um, be advocates for epistemic justice and to ensure that there is change out there. So in that regard, let us carry forward the torch of knowledge as academics, as scholars, as researchers, as people who work in corrections, doing community engagement projects, to ensure that we provide, we change the world, to ensure that we use this torch of knowledge and justice to light the way for a brighter future for those who are incarcerated. I thank you. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, um, I would like to call you again, Michelle. And we'd really like to honor you. As a member of the family now, thank you so much for joining our family and for being one of us. We look forward to continuous collaborations and sisterhood and working together. This also represents the women that I work with as well who are always with me and I carry them with all the time. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please, refreshments are served. Thank you. Actually, you know, like, who can I? Yeah, yeah. And it was, it was beautiful. It was beautiful how all the three.